everybody. My name is Ahava Liebteg. I'm the president of AHA Media Group. We are a content strategy and content marketing consultancy located right outside of Washington, D.C. I myself have been in the digital strategy space for over 15 years now doing different kinds of communications and really focused on content, content strategy, and content marketing in the last eight years. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about developing a mobile content strategy that works. Mobile has certainly changed everything about our lives drastically in the last three to five years. And so today I'm excited to talk to you about how mobile and content strategy fit together within your overall marketing and digital strategy. So let's start by talking about some of the challenges that we face with mobile devices. Um, today we're going to be talking about format, context, and use case scenarios. And then I'm going to give you three suggestions for how I think that you should be handling these within your marketing and your content strategy efforts around mobile. So let's first talk about format. So we see that um, design has changed tremendously. Um, even if you look at the latest versions of the iPhone, forget about Droid and all the other different kinds of tablets and smartphones that are being produced, but screen size has changed tremendously. And um, if you look at the first generation of the iPad and then the mini iPad and the smartphone, you really start to see the differences in how screens are. And this can create a lot of trouble for brands. Um, this is an example of BuddyPress, which is a WordPress support site. When you look at this site on the traditional desktop, it looks like this. And when you look at it on your smartphone, it looks like this. So this creates problems for brands because as they're trying to get their content out there and more and more of our audiences are accessing our content through mobile devices, they're going to continue to run into problems like this. This is One Direction's website. Please don't judge me. I have tween daughters. And this is what their website looks like on a traditional desktop. But when you go to their mobile site, it is not responding the way that you need it to in order to find all the information that you're looking for. Let's talk about context now because context is incredibly important in the mobile environment. So when we go to meetings and we look at the way that people now interact with digital devices, we see um, a tremendous variation. So it used to be that everybody had a desktop in front of them, like this slide is showing. But now when you go to conferences, what you really see is that people no longer really are using just laptops. They have a plethora of devices available to them, including their smartphones and tablets. Um, we also see that people are really um, using mobile devices in all sorts of environments, right? So they could be walking, they could be talking to somebody, they could be sitting on their bed relaxing. Two people um, are annoyed with each other because one wants to go to sleep and the other one is looking at the content on his device. And we know that children are really using a lot of these mobile devices. So we really see that people's context around how they're getting the information changes as well. So what do we know? Well, we know that people interact with digital information because they want information to perform a task or they're looking for some, sort, some form of entertainment. And we know that 9 out of 10 mobile searches leads to action, over half lead to purchase. But there's so much we don't know, right? And one of that is use case scenarios, and that was the third challenge that I spoke about earlier. So what's a use case scenario? Well, a use case scenario is what is the person doing at the moment? And this sort of touches upon context. Context is what's going on around them. But use case scenario is what are they trying to accomplish in the moment? So are they actually in a fixed or fluid state? Are they sitting in one place or are they moving? Are they focused or distracted? So is the person um, completely focused on performing a task with your content or your application? Or is the person distracted and sort of just flipping through their Facebook or Twitter feed or you know, just sort of looking at what the latest articles or news are and not really hunting for any particular piece of information? What else do we know? Well, here's something that we know about who these people are that are using your mobile devices. 52% of U.S. laptop owners also have a smartphone, and this tells you about cross-device usage. 
31% of U.S. smartphone owners have a tablet, and 13% of Americans own a laptop, tablet, and smartphone. Now, 13% is not a lot, but when you start to look at these numbers increasing over time, we're going to see those numbers begin to rise, and people are just going to have a multitude of these devices, whether they own them all themselves or they're in use in group or family situations. Most homes are going to have um, two or three of these devices, if not all of them. Here's a map that shows where these users are. So you see Android is in the green, not fully represented. The iPhone is in the red, and then BlackBerry is in purple. Um, I assume BlackBerry, this is an older map, I assume that BlackBerry is going to come out of the running, and we're really going to see that race being between Android and iPhone. And from this map, it looks like the iPhone is really winning, but I expect that as Droid continues its surge towards market domination, um, we may see it trying to pick up uh, a lot of those green circles. Where are they? So here we see um, a different map that uh, gives you this information in kind of a different way according to really the states and where we see Android dominance versus iOS dominance, and iOS is the operating system for Apple. When are they? So I, I think this graph is really interesting, and you can see that this is from Comscore, this data. It's from August of 2011, and I assume it's tracking a little bit differently now, although um, I think it's probably very similar. Mobile is in the aqua line, tablets are in the dark blue line, and then computers, a traditional desktop and laptop computers are in the orange line. And you can see that if we track the traditional computers, really that's something that's being used for work. The usage goes up starting around 6 o'clock, which is when most people in the United States begin working. And then it sort of keeps on pretty much on that high, it dips a little for lunch, and then continues to fall downward until about 6 p.m., which is the traditional end of the workday. But if you look at mobile, mobile is pretty consistent throughout the day. However, tablet use really rises at the end of the day. And this is because a lot of people really are using their tablets to consume mobile content that is more of entertainment value or shopping value or social networking and social media. That's really why people are using their tablets. They're more sort of of their fun devices rather than their work devices. And that's why you see this chart trending the way that it is. This is actually probably the scariest chart I've ever talked about in a webinar, but where are U.S. adults using smartphones? So we see that 55% are using them while driving, which is terrifying if you are a driver. I do think that we will continue to see that number plummet as um, more and more people are understanding how dangerous texting while driving is. Um, you know, AT&T's campaign of It Can Wait has definitely made inroads, particularly among the teen population. 9% um, of Americans are using their smartphones during sex. I don't know how this is occurring, but apparently it is. And, you know, more to the people who are brave enough to answer in the affirmative. And then 19% of them are using their smartphones in a church or place of worship, which means that God now takes email. So that's good to know. To build an audience of 50 million users, it took radio 58 years. So it took, just think about it from the perspective of how long does it take to get to an audience of 50 million? Well, radio, it was 58 years. For television, it took 14 years to get to an audience of 50 million. For the Internet, it took uh, four years. For Facebook, it took 3.6 years. And for the iPad, it took 80 days. So we really see that as marketers, um, the rate of change is exponential, and we keep shortening the time between every um, – chance that we give users to access our content using new technology or new platforms like Facebook. So it's even more incumbent upon us to really figure out how our mobile content strategy is working for people because they are accessing our content with these devices and how we really need to think about format, context, and use case scenarios so that we are serving up these delightful content experiences for our users, no matter what device they're using to access the content. So let's talk about what the jobs of a content marker, marketer are in the context of mobile. The first is that you need to understand content and distribution, and we're going to go into all of these in depth. The second is that you need to understand the use case scenario. And the third is that you need to create a user-friendly mobile experience. So let's walk through all of these and see how they fit into your current mobile strategy and how maybe you need to change things so that you really can keep up with the changing technology. 
So how do you understand content and distribution? And this is a really important part of something that I preach. I think it really helps marketers when they think about content in this way to sort of think about how they can repurpose it for different formats and for different delivery on all of these different kinds of channels. So content is really a piece of information, and you decide based on your target audiences what are the appropriate content formats for that audience. So let's take um, something that was thrown out at me at a recent um, presentation. I asked people in the audience for a piece of inf information that they were working on, and somebody said they were working on a public service announcement about what marijuana does to the human brain as a way to sort of explain to teenagers that this isn't a good drug to try. So that's the piece of information. This is what marijuana does to your brain. The content formats you select will be appropriate for your target audiences. So let's say your three target audiences are teenagers, their parents and educators in school classrooms and other places where teens get information about drug use. And so a content format that would be appropriate for an educator, like a white paper or a curriculum, um, would not be appropriate for a teenager because a teenager probably will not down a white, download a white paper, nor will he or she read the curriculum. But um, a teenager might be really interested in a video. We know that teens really love to consume a ton of video on YouTube and other video delivery channels. And so that might be a really good way to reach your teens. But a good way to reach your parents or to reach your teachers might be in other content formats that would be appropriate for them. So once you've figured out the type of format that you put your content into or your information, you then decide what the best place to distribute said content is. And so again, it might be really smart to put your video on YouTube, but it doesn't really make sense to put the white paper on YouTube because YouTube doesn't deliver white papers. Um, it might be a better place to put the white paper on a website or within a blog. This is where it gets really critical. Your content is not your website. Your content sits on your website. Your content is not your blog. Your content sits on your blog in the form of blog articles. Facebook is not your content. It's a delivery vehicle for getting your content out there. And thinking about content this way as divorced from the form of distribution until you decide what the best form of distribution and format is, is really critical to thinking about how to deliver content within a mobile format. So this is an example that I used to demonstrate this point. Um, in 1996, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, famously said, content is king. And so that's the piece of information. Now, I have no idea if Bill Gates has a Facebook page. I'm guessing he does not. But if he did, the format that he would choose to disseminate this piece of information is the Facebook status update box. And we've all seen these Facebook status update boxes. We all know what they look like. So it's a recognizable format for all of us. He puts content as king, and then he hits submit. And the channel for distribution that this is seen on is the f news feed. His friends see that he wrote this, and it also appears on his page. So Facebook is a platform for distributing and sharing content. The content itself, that status update, is a piece of content. But the information contained within it could be repurposed in a lot of different ways, not just in a Facebook status update. Let's talk about some social media mobile stats just to pepper the uh, webinar with some information that's helpful. 67% of monthly users are on mobile on Facebook, so you can tell that more of the audience to Facebook is coming through their smartphones and their tablets. 60% of all Twitter users are on mobile, and 40% of all videos are watched on YouTube using a mobile device. And remember, these statistics are probably from about a year ago. They are going to continue to grow and change as mobile becomes more of the way that people are accessing our content. Let's talk about understanding the use case scenarios of your target audiences. So here's where you really need to do as much research as you can about who your customers are so that you can understand the different use case scenarios that they use to access your content. Maybe you're the type of content that people really are looking for during the work hour and they really don't access on mobile. Maybe you actually do have the kind of content that people are only looking for when they're in a store to compare prices or they need a piece of medical information in an emergency. So you really need to, need to do research on your uh, looking at your analytics, building personas. What does the composite character look like of this person who's accessing your content? 
build scenarios. When are they accessing your content? What's going on for them? Are they in a focused or uh, fluid state? Are they distracted or are they paying attention to what they are doing? Um, you can test these things in the lab. There's tons of usability testing that you can do, and you can also test in the wild, which is something that I'm really a fan of. Um, asking, moving, going over to people and asking them to use your content or to interact with your content in a mobile situation will tell you so much that you need to know about what, um, how you're delivering your content and if you're hitting the needs of your target audiences. And the other thing that you really want to understand is their cross-device usage. How are they using these different devices? If 13% of them own all three of these devices, how are they using these devices when they're interacting with your content? So let's look at analytics. You can go into your analytics and you can see how many are coming from the desktop, mobile, or tablet. And if you drill down, the analytics will even tell you a lot about which devices are coming to your website. And this can help you to determine, in terms of responsive design and screen sizes, what your templates should look like. Cross device usage is really critical. 86% of Americans use a smartphone while watching TV, and we know this from recent events like Sharknado, which was a movie that it seemed like all of America was watching together. And then, um, we also know this from um, the Super Bowl and from the Oscars. People just tend to hashtag these things and really watch them together as they're watching a typical broadcast. And then 68% of smartphone usage happens at home. Um, one of the reasons that BlackBerry failed was that they, took, they didn't take into consideration how much fun people wanted to have with these devices. And what happened was, was that the iPhone, when it first came out, wasn't that fabulous device, and it didn't have a lot of the functionality that BlackBerry had, but it was more fun to use. And so what happened was executives would come home, and they would put down their BlackBerry, and they would pick up their iPhone in order to have fun with the device. So we see that we're still trending that way, that people are really using their smartphones at home. Um, they're not just using them for work purposes, but they're using them to interact with their friends, perhaps to interact with colleagues, to ch look up recipes, to check for health information, to make appointments, to find phone numbers, to make restaurant reservations. So there's all types of content applications that are happening um, at home and not just at work. So it's really important for you to know about your target audiences, how they're using when they're accessing your content and how they're accessing it. Are they using a couple of different devices at the same time? So we see this is just the normal um, thing that's going on. Guy's on a tablet, woman's got her smartphone, and she's watching TV with her daughter. This is cross-device usage um, in a visual. So you can really never know enough about your user audience, and you really need to do as much research as your data will give you, but also get out there and talk to your target audiences and find out what their needs are and what they're doing with your content. Job number three, how do we create a user-friendly mobile experience? So we're going to go through a couple of different things here with a user-friendly mobile experience. Um, we're going to look at loading times and how that affects mobile. We're going to look at ergonomic design, touch points, cues, and micro interactions in order to understand how, as a content marketer, you can think about things that overlap design, voice, and tone with actual content marketing. Whoops, I pressed that button too fast. Okay, so let's look at loading times. So this is a great infographic that shows you how website performance um, affects shopping behavior. And if you look at that first um, little dial thing, it says 47% of consumers expect a web page to load in two seconds or less. And then 40%, if you look at the right of that, abandon a website that takes more than three seconds to load. That's crazy, right? I mean, that means that, you know, 40%, um, 4 out of 10 are the people are leaving your website if it takes more than three seconds to load. What's even scarier about that statistic is that 75% of people would not return to mobile websites that took longer than four seconds to load. So we know that if people get impatient, I just had this happen to me yesterday. I saw this article on Twitter, this tweet that looked that led to an article that looked really interesting to me, and I clicked on it, and in about three seconds I was like, forget it, it's not loading, and I clicked the back button. 
crazy. I mean, I couldn't wait another two or three seconds for the thing to load. No, I've been spoiled. Things load quickly. I don't want to have to wait for an article that takes too long to load. So when you think about the average person and what their patience is like, you really have to make sure that your enterprise architecture and your data architecture and the back end of your website and your mobile websites are doing what they need to do to load quickly. Ergonomics is a huge part of what's going on, so you really want to think about designing your pages for mobile in a smart way that takes into example, um, that takes into um, consideration how people actually interact with your content in a mobile device situation. So Ruk Robliowski did this research that showed um, he looked at you know 1,333 people using mobile devices on the street, 49% used the you know some, 36% um, are holding it and using their index finger, and then 15% are still in what he calls the crackberry stance, but that's um, how people traditionally use their blackberries. So if you look at these three different ways of holding a smartphone, you realize that your pages really need to be designed to take into account how people use their hands to navigate through a touch screen. So look at these differences in touch points, right? Um, on the left, you have Facebook, and you can see that it's really easy. It's th those are thick arrows and big spaces to hit on those status updates. If you look at the right, I just think that's funny. The New York Times arrest records are online, view yours now. Like, that's crazy. But that's a pretty large touch point right there that somebody could click on that link. However, if you look at the little search box and then the view sections, that's way smaller than the ad. And so the question then becomes, well, how are people supposed to reach that if they are using their thumbs? The, um, that third 15% is going to have a hard time scrolling and navigating through this New York Times website, which is an older version of what the New York Times looked like online in a mobile device. Again, with touch points, you can see you know, on the left how large those are and how easy they would be for somebody to click on them. And then you see this opinion meter, um, how excellent and very poor, and then that sliding scale gives people two different ways to show their opinions so that if they feel more comfortable with the slider, they can touch that or they can click on those little buttons um, in red and green. Cues are incredibly important, letting people know what things mean. So if you look at this first example at MobiQuick, there's a lot of things there I don't understand, like what is DTH, what is data card, and maybe this would be obvious to a user who would download this application, but maybe it wouldn't. So we need to think about, are we speaking human to people, and are we giving them cues that they would understand no matter their contact? context with this piece of content or this application. Um, here we see another one. This is um, an application that allows um, Christian families to make sure that they're spending adequate amounts of time with their teenagers. And it talks about this monthly virtue, and it allows you to enter in a number of hours. But again, it's clearer to me what these things are about, but I had to do a little research on the app to truly understand them. And then this is scan it. I think this does such a good example. It gives it's such a great example of what we're really looking for um, when we talk about cues. Scan it can only be used in a scan it store. Please verify that your phone Wi-Fi is turned on and you have connected to the store Wi-Fi. How much more human can you be than that? It's very simple, and I completely understand it. So think through what you're writing and what your content looks like, and make sure it's conversational and it appeals to people. When people's our context is constantly changing around them, or even if they're in a fixed state on their couch, you want to make sure that they can still understand all the things that they need to do to be able to access your content in a mobile situation. And then micro interactions, again, are these sort of um, more than cues, they tell people what they need to do. So login failed, unable to connect to Facebook, please try again later. Good example. Um, this LinkedIn example to me is just absolutely atrocious. I mean, you're really going to ask somebody to prevent unauthorized um, access to their account. You're going to ask them to put in those words. I mean, what if they're in a car or a moving subway? Um, what if they're walking on the street? It's just so aggravating when those things happen in a mobile environment. So really think through your audience's use case scenarios and what they might be doing at the time. And if these kind of things are going to aggravate them, they're just going to bounce, and they're not going to bother trying to get through the gate. 
And here are, um, is another example of where I think that this might make somebody feel like a bomb was about to go off on their phone. What the heck is a gateway setting and what's a network connection? Um, that's for developers, that kind of language. That does not work for your typical average consumer. So think through that carefully. This is a mobile glossary that we created at AHA Media Group. You're welcome to download it. It will give you 10 terms that will um, help you understand how to talk about mobile in a more intelligent, um, constructive fashion. This is my book, The Digital Crown, Winning at Content on the Web. Um, it came out in November of 2013, and I would love for you to go to thedigitalcrown.com and download the first chapter for free, and then hopefully you'll skedaddle on over to amazon.com and order the book. Um, it's a great read about content and content marketing and how content strategy fits into those um, two disciplines. Um, if you have any questions after watching this webinar, I'd love to hear them. You can email me at ahamediagroup.com. At aha My Twitter handle is ahavl. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun, and I appreciate it.